and I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, phrase, fake it so you make it. Right. Kim, I, <laughs> I, I have never been someone who could fake it. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast. I'm Kim Skorupski. On today's episode of the Triple H, The Habits and Hacks from Hopkins, I'm very pleased to bring to you Dr. Tina Tron. Tina, how are you? Good. I'm doing well, Kim. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm a little bit chilly sitting here in my basement, but I'm so pleased that you've joined us today. And I you know, wanted to start off with having you introduce yourself to the podcast audience. We've been learning a lot about our healthy habits and hacks and efficiencies and routines and practices, but would you please get us started by telling everybody what you do here at Hopkins? Absolutely. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Tina Tran. I'm currently a, an assistant professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. I also hold a joint position as assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology. Kim, I've been here since 2005, where I started my anesthesia residency. I graduated in 2008 and looked at various positions and jobs and found that Hopkins was such a welcoming place, a place for me to grow and a place for me to be both a a mentee and a mentor that I stayed on for several years. I was here when our operating rooms were all on the same floor on Blaylock 7. Now it's a world-renowned simulation center. And before the buildings, the the towers of Bloomberg and the Diet Towers grew from Hopkins. So my other positions that I hold here are um, assistant program director in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine. We have about 75 to 80 residents in our class, um, including the first years to third years. And with my leadership team, we help to mentor and engage our our residents, help to uh, guide them towards success. And uh, we're proud to say that several of our residents have grown to become uh, leaders. Some have become chairs of divisions and departments. So very proud accomplishment. In addition to my role there, Kim, I'm I'm also one of the co-clerkship directors for the medical students. And through my leadership, along with my co-partner and the other coordinators, we've increased the medical students who have applied to the field of anesthesiology significantly over the past few years. So these are my top, my top passions, <laughs> and <laughs> among many. And uh, nationally, uh, I'm on the Committee for Medical Students Education uh, with the Society of Education and Anesthesia. We meet every year and discuss ways that we can improve uh, spreading anesthesia and the educational uh, components of anesthesia nationally and internationally. Uh, I'm on several committees of the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, specifically on the uh, Medical Student and Resident Education Committee, and um, I'm on the board of directors for the Ophthalmic Anesthesia Society. Uh, We're nationally and internationally known, uh, and I was past president uh, in uh, 2018. So all these leadership positions have given me really wonderful opportunities to meet so many people and be inspired by them. And Hopkins, I feel, is my home to allow me to do this. And um, I look forward to speaking with you about all these opportunities that I've had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of being a part of. That is a lot. And I mean, just hearing you talk makes me think, of course, this is a natural leader. This is one of those people who was... If I were to talk to your family members or friends from when you grew up, they'd be like, oh, of course, Tina. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind she's a natural born leader. And I'm wondering if that's true. And even if it's not true, what habits or routines would your all, all your protégés, all these you know, 80 residents and your colleagues, to what would they attribute your leadership style or your leadership portfolio. So if in two parts, again, are you a natural born leader? Uh, yes or no. And either way, what typifies you? What are the characteristics of your leadership style? So Jim, I would not consider myself a natural leader. Growing up, and I remember from elementary school and moving forward, I would be very shy, introverted, kept to myself a lot. And in, in a group, I would blend in kind of lay low, fly under the radar. I I kept that mentality as I went along through college, through medical school. And in terms of my introverted personality, I I tend to listen very carefully. And I've always been raised to 
speak and say nice things or positive things. And if you don't have any positive components to contribute or to say, it's best to keep quiet and listen mm -hmm. and listen intently right. and contribute when there's, there's things that are significant. And then for the opportunities of leadership, I, I was speaking with a colleague of mine and uh, we went through a residency together and he mentioned to me, he said, 90% uh, is just showing up, showing up early, showing up enthusiastic and people will see this about you and they will offer you positions that you yourself didn't think that was within your personality or characteristic. And that's what I did. I went to these meetings um, first as a, as a participant. And then I, I went to all the committees. If the committee met at 7 a.m., I was there at 6.30 and I would meet some of the, the other leaders and talk about them and get to know them on a personal level. Before I thought these leaders were out of my reach, I was intimidated by them. But having just coming over, sitting next to them and saying, hello, my name is Tina. I'm really interested in you know, your, your research in clinical education. Please tell me more. And with that, statement and that introduction, they said, oh, thank you for your interest. Let's collaborate. And based on just that simple introduction, that initiating the conversation, I've had such wonderful opportunities to collaborate with people around the world. Wow. Um, yeah, that, that is really surprising to me because I, I, that is not my personality to begin with, but then to, uh, to have this kind of warm and encouraging reception has really led me on the path to all these leadership positions that I uh, continue to maintain and be offered. And another important component is advocating for, for yourself. I'm involved in uh, all these committees for several years. I, I see that I have the potential to lead. And of course, there's a lot of learning along the way. It's, some are born leaders and some kind of get to it along the way and incorporate what they learn to enhance their skills. And that's me. I, I kind of watch to see what skills that I have, how I can improve. And based on that, I advocate for some of the positions that I feel I'm, I'm ready or can learn from. And then I approach the appropriate members and say, I'm ready, consider me. And surprisingly, Kim, all it takes is that advocating for yourself, saying I'm ready for people to open up the opportunities. You have said so much that I think is just so interesting, and and this is where the extrovert in me gets going and, and has a hard time being quiet because you've said like 10 things, and I just want to go, ooh, 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 that's so interesting, starting with the fact that you are a self-admitted introvert, and I love when I hear introverts talk about leadership because it's always so often that off the charts e loud mouth extroverts like me it's like you're it's obvious that they're going to be a leader because they can't stop talking and they're just blah 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 and if you talk to anybody in my family growing up they would say oh yeah kim was a born leader from get go she i was the one who at the age of 8 put together a library in my basement and use the Dewey Decimal System to organize the books, made my siblings read books, do book reports. I gave them um, scores. I kept uh, grade books for my siblings. I mean, I was running the show. And so it's obvious that someone like me is an extrovert leadership. I love that you started off with saying, I was a born introvert, laid low, kept my head down. And yet here you are, and, and I, just for those of you who are listening to this, there's a great book called Quiet. And just because someone is introverted doesn't mean that we have plenty, plenty of introverts who are wonderful leaders. So I love that you have elevated and reminded the audience of the power of introverts and especially your unique blessing of being able to listen and listen deeply, which you also alluded to. And in everything you said about you know, that first uh, colleague of yours saying, number one key, show up, show up early and be there, and then advocating for yourself, I get that that happened. And I'm just really curious about the trigger. What was the trigger that made, that flipped you from saying, I just would like show up, be quiet, keep my head low, fly under the radar, to all of a sudden deciding to show up early and ask questions ostensibly to then be given these leadership opportunities. Do you remember what the trigger was in you or around you that moved you from laying low under the radar, you know, just listening to stepping forward and 
advocating directly or indirectly for opportunities to serve as a leader. Do you remember what the trigger or triggers were? Absolutely, Kim. So I would look at um, my colleagues and uh, oftentimes, Kim, it's very different for me to compare myself to colleagues because I feel that we're all going at our, our own pace, our own stride and celebrating our own successes. But uh, I also had moments where I was looking at my other colleagues, some who uh, were my residents or uh, my medical students, and they were advancing. They were becoming leaders. And I I looked and I said, what is this? And I was very impressed with both their, their ability to grow and ability to grow at such a fast pace. Uh, the colleague that encouraged me to show up, be there, be enthusiastic, he was um, we graduated the same year, but he had all these positions. He uh, had been promoted to associate professor within a couple years. He was involved with several companies and help, helping to start them. And uh, I said, well, we're, we're pretty much uh, on the same trajectory, but here you are so successful. And here I am successful. In, and, and I was very proud of myself, him successful in that I was um, a great I felt like I was a great mentor, a teacher, a mom, a wife, a, a daughter. But uh, seeing his successes, I I looked and said, uh, or I thought to myself and said, I, I'd like to see where what my potentials are if I followed this this lead that he he suggested to me. And he did it so organically. He said this it was just organic for me. I just started conversations. So I said great, I can start conversations. And so I had to get over my own fears because, and I hope it doesn't come across, but I have uh, an innate fear of public speaking. It took me a long time to be able to speak in front of crowds, in front of even a small group. And so starting with small conversations and uh, recognizing that these small conversations opened up so many doors and uh, continuing to, to just start small. Start with a one-on-one -on -one interaction, expanding it into a small group, and now a large crowd, a committee, uh, an organization. That kind of organically helped me open up and be a little more confident in my ability to take on the roles that I knew deep down inside that I was able to take on. Well, that that to me is is another such. Gosh, such an important lesson that you you acknowledged. I was good at. I mean, after all, Dr. Tran, you are in the Distinguished Teaching Society of Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine, so you're obviously at this point, this before the leadership positions and opportunities, very successful. And so I like how you you've shared with us this kind of an epiphany of. I feel like I can contribute more. What I love and respect about that is the authentic feeling or passion that I feel like I can do more, be more, serve more versus someone who says, I want a leadership role. My, you know, that who are um, leadership hungry, that they, some people uh, may feel like, I, I don't care what the leadership title is. I just want a leadership title. So people seeking glory or titles or degrees or awards and recognition simply for those superficial, you know, credits, which is, is it to me, it, and when I meet people like that who say, I want to be a leader, and I'm like, well, what do you want to do? And like, I don't know. It doesn't matter. You tell me, what can I do? <laughs> that that kind mm -hmm. of X, Y driving X or X driving Y versus you know, the reverse causal, I'm thinking that's really not the right order of things. It usually comes about, like you said, Tina, organically of a, of a recognition that I'm fine. Thank you very much. I feel like I'm using my gifts and talents and I'm I feel accomplished. I feel satisfied. And yet there's something in me that's making me feel like I, there's opportunity for more growth. So you said something else that leads me to this idea of sometimes we, a book I was reading, and of course now I can't remember, probably in the habit book, um, com where the author says, comparison is the thief of joy when applied broadly. Mm -hmm but the teacher of skills when applied narrowly. So the idea that sometimes when we compare ourselves to other people on their big things, we think, oh, I'm terrible. I, I'll never be good like that. But when we compare um, little things, we can use those as levers to improve. So 
this whole idea of compare it, comparison being the thief of joy in your experience, then you were comparing yourself to your trainees and colleagues, and it wasn't robbing you of joy. In fact, to me, it seems like it was providing opportunity for more joy, amplifying your joy. Can you talk about that some more? Absolutely, Kim. So to to really harness that that power, that that belief that you know you're you're deserving and it's very joyful what you do, whether you have a leadership position or not. I think one of the first steps is to be happy for the person that you're engaging with, and and envy can can take you in very different directions. If you're envious of someone, it can make you resentful. It can make you feel very negative, say, oh, what is going on? Is the world against me? Why am I not in an equal or higher position than another colleague? Or it can inspire you. It, you can say, you know, you can look at a person and say, wow, what a successful, what, what, a, um, what a role model. What are they doing? How can I uh, be very similar? Or how, what are they doing that's leading them to this position and being so successful, so happy? And speaking with them and saying, I'm interested. I want to learn from you. And people, once they see that you're interested and in seeing this positive side of what they're doing or the position that they hold, they're more than happy to say, thank you for your interest. And this is what I'm doing. And let me know how I can help you. So it's being, being a happy for the person in that leadership position and then and engaging them and saying, show me or, or lead me in how I can also share in a very similar joy, a very similar uh, outlook in life, and eventually be in that leadership position or be in that role model position. And Kim, you're absolutely right. Being a leader, it's a role that it's, it's uh, much more than a title. Uh, I feel in all of my leadership positions, I need to earn that every day. All of my roles, I earn. I feel like there's something that I should be doing every day to say yes. Uh, she is is right to be in that position. Uh, she's doing everything she can to work as hard as she can to continue that leadership role, and that's that's my most proudest accomplishment every day. And and when I go to bed at the end of the day, I'll actually run through in my head like these are these are my roles, and I'll I'll look at maybe the top three, the top five, and say yes, I've accomplished what I feel in my in my uh, acknowledgement or in my belief that yes this this is I'm deserving of this leadership title or this mentorship title so it's really just a wonderful opportunity yeah and I and I and I hear your gratitude and your joy in, in your voice and and I just love the way your journey brought you to this naturally and your openness and and I am especially admiring your juxtaposition of the envy versus inspiration. It's so easy, especially in a place like Hopkins, to be envious and then getting going down this dark tunnel of why them, why, why not me, and feeling sorry for ourselves or, or feeling and beating ourselves up, or then that, that darkness turned inward or then outward. Rather, flipping that switch and thinking about it, you know, putting on a different set of lenses and looking through a, wow, I'm so happy for them. They're clearly doing something that is in their, their lane. They're so good at that. It's like watching. I always, you know, think of when, when I watch someone doing something and and doing it well, it's like watching a, a professional athlete or a ballerina or a musician. I mean, these top level performers of gymnast and you see them and you watch them and you're you get goosebumps and you think oh my gosh it's amazing they're doing exactly what they're born to do what a gift and isn't that beautiful and perfect and it just moves you and it's the same thing with with leaders so i i love that your your heart is one of seeing that and celebrating that and then that kind of obviously turns into reaping what you sow, that that joy, that celebration, the inspiration becomes not only part of you, but clearly must be imparted to your trainees and all those, you know, 80 residents running around. Absolutely. And I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, phrase, fake it till you make it. Right. Kim, I, <laughs> I, I have never been someone who could fake it. 
Uh, and I, whenever there's anything that stresses me uh, out or that um, I feel, you know, something that's not right, I'll either be quiet or speak up against it. I, I it's rare, very rare for me to put on a smile when I strongly feel like something is not, not positive. It's not a win-win situation for anybody involved. Mm-hmm. So in, in those situations, I'll listen. Uh, I'll, I'll listen to the other person or the other person's side of things because, um, deep down inside, we all want to be heard. And so, um, listening to that and sometimes just reflecting, say, this is how, this is how I hear you approaching the situation. And then going forward with a collaborative approach to success versus smiling and saying, I agree with you. You know, yes, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And, uh, sweeping it under the rug. So that's what I, I try to tell all the people who are around me. And um, it's interesting. A, a lot of my patients and my clinical colleagues see this. They said, oh, we, we see, you know, we're, we see that uh, with this interaction, you know, you're, you're not smiling or you're not very happy about it. I said, yes, and this is, these are my concerns, but this is how we're going to uh, be successful moving forward. In situations where as a teacher uh, and as a leader, I don't feel like I should be the one giving all the answers or, or dictating any part of the team dynamics. It's about engaging all members of the team and getting their input. And as an introvert, sometimes I, I look to the most quiet member of the team and say, that person's listening. That person is clearly has things that they want to say. And I'll make a mental note whether to encourage them to speak out during the, the group meetings or the team meetings or approach them later on. Like, like I started out in my, my position one on one and say, I, I noticed that, uh, you know, you were listening very intently during our meeting. Tell me what your ideas are. And so in these more personal interactions, they're more open to discussing their ideas. And then I'll bring that forward to the team. And I feel that in my, in my leadership role, um, even though I'm an introvert, just having that leadership role and speaking with a certain level of confidence and enthusiasm. I thought you were going to go in the different direction of the fake it till you make it. And I thought your line was going to be, well, you know, you don't feel like a leader, just fake it for a while. Or when you don't feel happy, just fake it for a while. But then you kind of flipped it on me. And I, and I love that you made me go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then I realized, well, you and I would never be able to play poker because I do not have what's going on in face. People totally can see my face where I, when I try <laughs> to pretend like I am happy, my friends have said, oh, yeah, I saw you on that Zoom yesterday. I could totally see that you, your head was going to explode. And I'm like, no, 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 I was fine. They're like, okay, <laughs> right. please. Everybody knows your face. Your face is so expressive. You have that one eyebrow that kind of creeps up. You purse your lips and you have a, put a fake smile on your face and we were all chatting offline when we knew that you were so mad. And I'm like, darn it. I was, but I was pretending that I was happy. They're like, it didn't work. <laughs> Absolutely. For those who know us or are getting to know us, Kim, I feel like that, that uh, fake it uh, till you make it opportunities are less and less. Uh, of course, there are certain situations where, yes, it's absolutely true. You're meeting someone for the first time. Lots of smiles, lots of head nods and, and agreements to move forward. But on the, the issues of, uh, you know, a more collaborative, intimate team setting and where you're heavily invested in, in a project or projects, uh, that really clinically affect everyone involved, it's, it's, uh, more difficult to do the faking part and it's definitely, much more important to to be invested and be transparent. So, how do you take Absolutely. what principles do you um, have you gleaned from this leadership style showing up and and reaching out to people who are quieter and getting their involved in their participation and how, how do you take all those lessons home? I mean, do you have any kind of habits or routines around? the joy at home and work-life integration, you know, we're hearing so much about that, especially on the heels of the pandemic. How are you, how do you apply some of these principles at home? Sure. And and I love that you called it the work-life integration because sometimes the terminology of work-life balance really causes more of a stressor than it it is uh, causing, you know, or, or introducing inspiration because people always trying to find this natural or or um, uh, achieve 
balance in the scale. Right. And sometimes that's not possible, but that's integration right. is just such a perfect description because you, you have a have to, part of your life that is um, what you've been working for in your career because all this schooling, all these student loans uh, kind of helps push you, motivates you to move forward, but then also have a part of yourself. And, and it's, you have to give yourself permission to step away from from this uh, forward trajectory for moments in a day or sometimes weeks at a time to say, it's okay, I am focusing on myself. My career is there and it's going to be waiting for me and uh, I, I will have these opportunities. And if these opportunities don't come to me, if I'm taking a break, going on vacation with my family or just spending my time with my family during these times where travel and vacations are you know, are very limited, um, just to, to be okay with it, to accept that, yes, um, opportunities will come. They'll always be there, whether you, you look for it actively or sometimes it'll come to you naturally. But accepting the fact that the opportunities, w- to spend the time in the moment, uh, to be happy in that moment, and then when you're able to uh, reset and move forward, you're able to do that as well. So giving yourself permission every day is, is very important. Well, Tina, I think this is a nice uh, chunk of information. I have to listen again because you had so many little nuggets in there that were so wise. And I really appreciate your perspective on things. And I know the audience has learned a lot from you. Any parting words before we sign off today? So this is a, what a wonderful opportunity. And sometimes I feel like I have to pinch myself to say how fortunate I am, um, recognizing that these opportunities, of course, there's moments of luck, there's moments of hard work, but just having the opportunity to be grateful and to have my health and to have um, my family and friends around me and to have the support that I have is just wonderful. Like I, uh, there's definitely moments where pessimism and uh, doubt creep in. And to allow those uh, moments to creep in because we're all human, we're not perfect, we make mistakes, and uh, the important thing is to learn from them, to grow from them, and uh, to take each step at a time. It's okay to leap and bound sometimes, but it's okay to also slow down, take a breath, and then start over. So, Kim, I thank you for this opportunity. This is wonderful to to share this conversation with you and to to be a part of this uh, initiative and this project. So glad that we had the opportunity. Folks, this is Dr. Tina Tran. I'm sure you are as inspired and motivated as I am. I just also feel so relaxed and heard. I love talking to you. I just something about your your style is really to me it's giving me another reminder that I need to talk less and listen more because I've learned a lot from you and I feel a lot better. You've been listening again to Dr. Tina Tran. This is the Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. Be well. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.